<laughs> well, well, well. <laughs> well, I, I, um, I guess what's in my heart is that we serve a great and mighty God. Amen. Yes, we, we serve a great and mighty God. Hallelujah. And um, some of you know me, some of you don't know me. Um, when I was very young in high school, I dedicated my life to the Lord. And I decided that I would live my whole life for the Lord. And uh, I decided that I would see how much I could do for the Lord and live my life for him. And uh, not long after that, I turned my back on God. <laughs> and uh, I'll never forget, you know, because I, I was so full of zeal and, and pursuing Jesus in high school. And then it, I, I got disillusioned. I backslid for a year found myself in a secular university. And I came to the point where I convinced, I was, I convinced myself that God had never called me. And that I could maybe just pay for people to do mission work and things like that. And I'll never forget, I was driving home from school and I said, nah, God's never called me. He just wants me to get a normal job, make a lot of money, you know, support missionaries. <laughs> that night an angel of the Lord appeared to me. Yeah. Uh, six one, I came up to hear on that angel. And he had a Bible in his hand. He glowed like the sun. And he said, come and read. And I read, I will go before you and make the rough places smooth. I will break in pieces the gates of brass, cut and sunder the bars of iron. And I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord God, have called you. Wow. And I want you to know the treasures of darkness is not money. No, it's the people that are lost. They're in the kingdom of darkness. Wow. And I have traveled all over the world. I lived in uh, Central America for five years. The Lord opened the door for us. We were the first missionaries to live in the Soviet Union. We lived there 10 years, wow. started many churches. I uh, personally started and pastored, uh, well, I'm now in my ninth church. Uh, we were always pastoring churches. We started lots of Bible schools. Saw God move all over the world. And uh, so I, 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 since I feel I'm talking to seasoned Christians tonight, okay? And so... Um, I have seen God move everywhere. And there is a danger in seeing God move that we come to a point where God stops moving in our life. And all our stories are from 20 years ago, 30 years ago. It's true, it's true. And when we go to the grocery store, we go by people who are both lost and needy. I'm not talking about needy in the financial sense. Right, right. I'm talking about brokenhearted. They're sick. True. We have the answer in us, but there's no release of his presence. We serve a great and mighty God. We serve a great and mighty God. And his greatest desire is that we win the lost and we, we meet the needs of the masses around us. Because they, they need so many things. God loved the world. God so loved the world. God so loved your neighbor. God so loved right. your family. And so many times we get into our own Christian funk that we, we stop being the light of the world. We talk about light. We stop being the salt of the earth and we talk about salt. We <laughs> teach on prayer, but we don't pray. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. We, we got all the sermons and everything. And uh, I had a, a, a person in my church ask me, he said, Pastor, I, he, I've almost given up on praying for people. I said, why is that? He said, well, when I prayed, prayed for people, it didn't work. And I know we've probably all been there where we've experienced laying hands on people, praying for people, or we have an issue in our life that doesn't get answered. Right? Am I the only one that's ever happened to? Amen. That's something that, 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 that okay, because I want to talk about how to turn a no into a yes today, how to turn an impossible situation around. But you know, I just want to just I want to challenge everybody because every every one of us in our Christian walk, we come to a point where we we hit like a roadblock, we hit a, a mountain, a wall. And what happens is, after a while, we just learn to live with the wall. We don't speak to the mountain anymore. We kind of give up, whether it's relational, whether it's financial, whether it's physical, all kinds of things in our life, and. Uh, you know, I love the disciples. The disciples were just like us. Jesus healed everyone who came to him. The disciples had real issues getting anyone healed. When he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, he left the nine, I call them the nine dodos, down at the bottom. And because uh, they would have messed up the party at the top. And a father brought a son who was demon-possessed, and they couldn't cast the devil out. 
Right. right. And after Jesus cast the devil out and they moved on, they said, okay, when they were in a room, no one else could hear their shame. Why couldn't we do it? He said, this doesn't come out but by prayer and fasting. And the real issue is when we come against a wall, when we pray for someone and they die, when we pray for someone and they don't, uh, someone who's crippled and they don't walk, what do we do? Well, most people here turn off the switch of faith at that point in their life, and they just talk, but they never walk anymore with the Lord in that area. Yeah. And, and I just want to encourage you tonight to turn the switch back on. Yeah. And, and, but the real, the bottom line is, in the secret place of our prayer life, we cry out to God for more anointing. And that's, that's the real truth. We, we need breakthroughs in our lives. We need breakthroughs in our bodies. We need breakthroughs in our finances. Yes. Yes. But, we, but here's the issue. When it happens to us, we just kind of, we, we've already come to the point where we, we, we uh, live with the wall. It's like living with a wall in our life that we can't get around. And so tonight I want to talk about uh, the story of Hezekiah, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, went to him and said, this is what the Lord says. Now, now, if you don't know what God was saying, if you had a prophet come and you're sick, how many of you know you want to hear him say, you're going to live and not die? Amen. How many of you know that was not the, the message of Isaiah? Becky he said the opposite. This is what the Lord says, put your house in order because you're going to die and you will not recover. <coughs> You will die and not live. <coughs> now, Hezekiah did not need a second opinion because Isaiah was a prophet. I don't know, you know, when you get a doctor you don't like, you can always get a second opinion. But when God speaks, you can't get a second prophecy. Yeah, but what God was saying wasn't that it was his will for Hezekiah to die, but if, that if all things continued as they were, that he would die. And so, when we get a bad report in our life, how many of you ever had a bad report? Oh yeah, come on. I'm not talking about school, I'm talking about life. You have to understand the doctors are not lying when they give their bad report. But we need to understand that if everything continues as it goes now, it will end just as the doctors say. And the Bible is full of people in desperate situations. Churches are full of desperate people in desperate situations. Mark chapter 5. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus. Now this guy was a synagogue ruler. That means he had position, money, prestige. He came there seeing Jesus. He fell at his feet. How many of you know this guy's at the end of his rope? Amen. For a guy of such prestige and money to fall at the feet of a, of a man. And he pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? And so we've had desperate situations. We've come to the, a wall in our life where we can't get over it. We have, like Paul, we've sought the Lord three times. You know, I, I, I admire Paul. At least he sought the Lord three times. Most of us ask God for one minute and then we quit. Very few of us are diligent that we stay there until the mountain moves. Am I right? Yes. I learned a secret a long time ago. The devil knows he can outlast you. He knows that if you don't get an answer in five minutes, you're going to quit. Mm -hmm. Am I right? right? Well, we have lost the ability to be tenacious in prayer. But I want you to catch something here. Even though the, that God told Hezekiah that he was going to die, Five minutes later, he sends back Isaiah chapter, uh, verse 7. Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. They did so, applied it to the boil, and he recovered. So it went from you shall surely die to he recovered. Amen. But what's, what, what happened there? What, what happened? What stopped? What changed God's note to yes? What changed the impossible situation? What changed his death sentence to a life sentence? What happened when he got the sentence? Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and he prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully 
and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. So he turned his face to the wall of God and heard him. Let me give you three, three quick points tonight. Point one. And this is how to turn your impossible situation around, how to move that.